Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Rebecca Levis coming to you from San Diego, and we're going to study Torah together. Today, we are in our eighth, eighth, yeah, eighth portion of the new Torah cycle, and we're in the story of Isaac and Jacob and Esau, and this story today is something like out of a Netflix series. It is full of drama. Um, it's full of backroom deals. It's full of rape. It's full of deception, um, manipulation. Hmm. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? I always say to my kids, history repeats itself in every generation. They just give it different names and different titles. So we've got a lot to cover today. By the way, I've got a lot of good words today in Hebrew, and I'm going to be sharing them with you. So go grab your favorite Hebrew word book so you can write these down and add them to your Bible. And also, if you want to join me and you're listening for the first time and you want to receive the PowerPoints as well as these teachings, you can email me at rjlevas, L-E-V-A-S, at gmail.com. And I'll add you to the group emails, and you'll receive these weekly in your email. So let's get started today, and I'll share my screen. Okay, as a reminder, I wanted to tell people, if you haven't gotten your workbooks, you can get it on Amazon. It's called A Year Through the Torah, and it's about $38, and follow us weekly in this workbook. And I want to also share with everybody that on page 22 is the prayer that is said prior to Torah study. And uh, I'm going to say it for you today because I haven't done that. And I'd like to let you hear how it sounds. It goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melaka alam. Asher kiddishano b'mitzvotav v'tzevanu la'asok b'devrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to busy ourselves or to be immersed. Immerse yourself in the words of Torah. Amen. So that is the prayer. And today we are in Vayishlak. Vayishlak means, and he sent. And the story begins with Jacob returning from the uh, exile that he went to with um, Laban. And he met Leah and Rachel and married. And now he's coming back to the land of Canaan. And he sends messengers out. And that's what this story begins with and he sent and that's speaking of jacob now jacob is the only patriarch that we have really watched grow up from birth till adulthood into marriage and burying his father and so we've watched him grow up both physically but also spiritually there there's 22 chapters um, of Jacob, and he is the main story in 22 chapters. So Jacob is a very important figure because from Jacob will come the tribes of Israel, and they were to be a light to the nations, and they were to multiply and fill the earth. So Jacob has a lot of importance in the Torah. So this is all about restoring the world, God winning the world back through the Messiah. So Jacob, in these 22 chapters, is learning to live what I call the covenant lifestyle. That means putting God first. That means following him faithfully. And that means be willing to be persecuted, misunderstood, or even perhaps killed for the sake of the plan of God. And so we see that that takes commitment and courage and consistency in his walk. And that applies to you and I too today. So he's already had many God encounters. Remember the ladder and where he laid down and he put his head on some rocks and then he saw the ladder going up and down. And we said that ladder was the bridge between heaven and earth and it pointed to the Messiah. So he's already learned that God is with him. God has given him favor at many different encounters. And now he is going to meet this brother who he left 20 years earlier. And the brother Esau had murder in his heart because he told his father that Jacob had stolen the birthright when really he had sold it. So he wasn't being honest with his father. And we'll find that it's Jacob is the one who wants to please God at all 
turns. So I want to go over the word Vayashlak and show you where it comes from. There's so many rich words in this story that apply to this story that I want to break it down really quickly for you. Va means and, and ye means and he, and the word or the verb is shalak, and this is where it is um, given its meaning to send out. So here it is, shin lamed uh, chet, and it means a delivered gift. So this is interesting that in this story, Jacob is sending out messengers with gifts, and that's the meaning in this word. And then you look at these two letters, the lamed and the het in these words, I want to show you what comes from that. It's an ancient symbol, the Lamed, and it means a shepherd's staff or to teach or lead or direct. And then the Het, its ancient symbol, is a fence or a boundary or a protection of some sort. So look at the words that come that are similar to this. This means the one who is sent. Okay, and if you look here, this is the command or an imperative, which means go. It means lach. And then you put a mem on the front, and it's malach, means to penetrate. And it's also the word for salt. So see, we are to go into the world and be a blessing, a delivered gift. And it's also the word for look. A disciple or the apostles are called shaliach. So the one who is sent is a shaliach. And it's just like this. See the shin lamed het, shin lamed het, but it's just got different vowels. So the one sent is a gift to the world. So here we see the story of Jacob and his 12 children. We're going to see the 12 being completed today in this story with uh, Joseph and Benjamin, and then we're going to see that God wants to send them out into the world, and sometimes it comes with uh, being scattered, and so exiles, we'll see all through the scripture, exiles have a purpose, because in the exile, God makes us grow, and then he makes us come back and be successful, so that's one of the principles of an exile. So God uses judgment to bring about a greater redemption. And we see this principle over and over in surgery. Uh, in surgery. Sorry, that's a nurse coming out of me, right? I was an ICU nurse. Okay, so God was building intimacy and integrity and a destiny for Jacob or Israel. So now we could fast forward to the book of Numbers and see what is going to come out of Jacob and the 12 tribes. It says a star will come out of Jacob. This is a prophecy given in the book of Numbers to Moses. So um, that star represents people because remember he said, I'm going to multiply you more than the sands of the sea. That's the earth and the stars of the sky. So the sand and the stars are going to be the two witnesses that we'll see in the very end of the Bible, where God will multiply his people in a final war that God will win in the end. All nations where Israel's been scattered in the end will all come against little tiny sliver Israel. So lots going to come from this story today. Now I wanted to show you th this story uh, on the map so you can see where uh, Jacob is coming from. He's going back home. He wants to go home and he knows he's going to meet Esau. So he sends gifts to him. Now here's Esau way down here in the land of Seir. And this was the land given to Esau by God, and it's called the uh, people there are called the Edomites. So he's going to come up and meet um, his brother Jacob at Peniel. And then from there, they're going to go to Shechem, and we see the story of the conflict with Dina. And then uh, he's going to go back to Bethel and then return home to Hebron, where his father Isaac and Abraham both dwelt. So um, this is a story jam-packed, and uh, let's get started with the story. Now, after 20 years, remember he had to serve Laban first seven to get um, 
work for Leah and then seven more. He was deceived seven more to get Rachel. And then he had to work six more to win his flocks. And so he's coming back very wealthy with servants and lots of flocks. And he's going to um, send gifts to his brother Esau. And here's what they were to say to my Lord from your servant. So Jacob is being humble and he's calling his older brother, my master or Lord, Adon here. That's the word in Hebrew. So he's showing respect. He's not hostile towards his brother. He wants to be reconciled in the physical, but we'll see at the end here that there's no spiritual reconciliation. It's just a temporary um, physical um, uh, reconciliation. But he said, to my Lord, from your servant, he's being humble, I'm coming and I've been given God's grace. So grace appears here in this story, and that's the word chen. So I've been given grace or favor, and I have many flocks and servants, both male and female, and I'm sending you this news in order to win your favor. So he's willing to take all the things that God has blessed him with and give back to reconcile with his brother. And this is exactly what we do as believers and followers of Yeshua, the Messiah, is God gives us gifts and then we take that grace and we give it back to others to win favor for the Father. In other words, share the gospel to bring more into the kingdom. And that's exactly what the Israelites were to be, a light to the nations. And you and I are part of that legacy. So then the messenger returned to Jacob and told him that Esau had agreed to come, but he was bringing, uh-oh, 400 men with him. Now, reconciliation can be very intimidating and fearful and unpredictable. And this is what in the flesh Jacob was feeling. And even though spiritually he wanted what was right, sometimes to do what's right spiritually is scary. And it's intimidating. Uh, many times when we share our faith, it can be scary and intimidating, right? But we go in spite of the fear. So he says he's got 400 men. Now, remember, I told you number four is the number of global or the whole world. So it's as if the whole world is coming against him. In other words, he's, he's viewing this as if his brother could have the potential to destroy him and all of his family. Now remember, God had promised Jacob to have descendants. So in his spirit, he knew that God was going to give him victory. But in the flesh, he was looking at uh, Esau as if looking at the world part of Esau. In other words, 400 men. That's like an army coming against you. And sometimes it can feel like that in the world system, right? When we're standing up for something that's biblical, it seems like the whole world at times can come against us. And yet Jacob was willing to go, but he had a strategy and let's see what the strategy was. Now in fear, the very first thing he does, which is always a good idea, is he prays. And Jacob said to the Lord, I'm not worthy of all these blessings. I left broke and empty handed. Basically, he crossed the Jordan with just his staff, he said. But now he's coming back with two camps, meaning a double blessing or a double portion. So we can see here that he's won God's favor. So he prays and he says, rescue me from Esau. I'm afraid that he will kill me in my flesh and have disregard for my wife and children. So he doesn't know what's really going to happen. And Jacob reminds God of the past promise when he said, remember, you were going to multiply me. Now, don't forget, God, remember what you said, right? He says he's going to be more nu numerous than the sands of the sea. So there's two camps and he's hoping perhaps that if one of them gets destroyed, there still be a remnant. So he's not quite sure what's going to happen. You know, maybe it's just going to come, part of us are going to come out and the blessing will come. So he's willing to risk it all, but he comes up with a strategy. So he sends his servants and animals 
first in sequences of blessings to this lost brother. Now, sometimes when I teach evangelism, I always say, you know, sometimes when we're going to somebody over and over and over, it can feel like you're not quite sure what's going to happen at each meeting, but you just keep blessing them. You just keep giving the gifts, the truth, and eventually you'll see a victory. And that's exactly what happens here in this story. So he sends out all of his, his uh, servants in groups of four, and he has to deal with past conflict in order to be reconciled. So he wants to give him gifts, and he says, please, he says, take these blessings from my hand. Now, he wants to appease his brother. And so he's saying, take these and may they be like an appeasement. And the word that's used here is kapara, but it means in the verb form to cover. In other words, I'm hoping that these blessings will make up for or cover the debt that you feel that I owe you, even though you, you didn't steal, I didn't steal the birthright, you sold it to me. And so it's the same word that we get for Yom Kippur, which is atonement, the day of atonement. So see how covering he's trying to atone or appease his brother. So we can see that Jacob has the right attitude. It's tied to Yom Kippur, where God made a way for us to be reconciled, both in the Old Testament and then through the Messiah in the New Testament. So aggression and humility can never mix. So Jacob comes back in humility and he doesn't come back to fight in the flesh. He comes back in the spiritual realm to be strong. And the first thing he did remember when fear came along as he prayed, he said, God, remember me. So remember in Hebrew, remember that word zakar? We learned that last week means act and speak on my behalf. So he comes and he embraces his brother when he finally sees him. And it says there was weeping and embracing. And I believe that Esau really did have regret and remorse. But we don't hear him saying, forgive me, do we? It's what we don't see here in this story that's important to understand the two hearts of Esau and Jacob. Remember, we're following the two seed lines. Esau never said, I'm so sorry, I lied to the father, I actually uh, sold the birthright to you, and I'm sorry for the murderous uh, feelings that I had towards you, none of that. What happens is he cries with regret and remorse. Now, that is not the same as repentance. Repentance comes with nothing in its hands. That's the great definition of repentance. In other words, no excuses. When you come to repent, you come with no excuses in your hand. You come with a, a humble heart and you say, I have uh, offended you and my heart hurts and I want to be reconciled. And I believe this was the heart of Jacob, but not necessarily the heart of Esau. So Esau needed a real heart transplant. Peace is never permanent unless there's a heart transplant. And so we're going to see by the end of this story that even though Esau came with remorse and regret, and um, it appears like there's this um, happy family again, it's only in the physical, in the spiritual, there's still battles to be won. And so this is what I'm trying to get across. When you look at the conflict, even today in the Middle East, everybody's looking at it through the physical. Oh, that should be our land because see, God gave it and es Esau was the firstborn and blah, 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 blah. But it's a spiritual battle. Jesus said in the New Testament and many others that this is a spiritual battle. So spiritually is what we're seeing here in Jacob. He wants reconciliation so that he can then come back and live in the land and fulfill his destiny. But that's not Esau. And you'll see that by the end of the study. Now, when they finally meet, it says that he kissed him 
and they both wept. Well, what's interesting to see whose heart is right. In the Masoretic text, remember the Masoretes who put the ball pointing in the text so people would, future generations, know how to actually phonetically pronounce all these words? Well, when they get to this part in the Torah that says that uh, Esau kissed Jacob, they actually put six little dots over the word kiss, indicating that the kiss was not sincere. It was of the flesh. And six is the number of man in the flesh. And what is the Antichrist? Six, six, six. So it's interesting that they see that. And if you unroll a kosher Torah scroll today, you will actually see those six dots over the word kiss. Now, finally, he accepted the gifts from Jacob, and Esau then wanted to mix the two families. Oh, here, you know, let's just um, get along. Let's, let's all live together. And Jacob wasn't going to fall for it. He, in his spirit, didn't trust Esau still. And so he says, no, you go back home and take the gifts that I've given you. And um, he says, I'll follow later. Well, Esau went back to Seir, but Jacob went back to the promised land. So it's not like Esau said, let, let me come with you now that I have found favor and live in the promised land that was promised to our forefathers. You notice he didn't do that, did he? He went back to the Edomites in Seir. So you can see that his heart spiritually was still distant from Jacob. So that's the storyline from there. Now, God's grace shows up in this story, and I want to show you the word. It's chenan, and I always say to everybody, grace didn't come just in the New Testament, and here it is, the word chenan in Hebrew, and you can find it in your etymological dictionary on this page, and I always tell everybody, this is the book I use in my Hooked on Hebrew class, which I'll be teaching in April, and I'll teach you how to use this book and look up all your words, so when you study your Bible, it becomes thrilling to look up these words and see connections in the New Testament. So then I wanted to show you how in Hebrews 12, 16, it says, let there not be any fornicators or profane people like Esau. So again, Esau is the one in the flesh who would be profane. And then it says, for he found no place of repentance. Remember, I said he never said, forgive me, Jacob, though he sought it carefully with tears. Remember, he cried when he, when he went to his father for the blessing and he wept bitterly. And then he comes back to Jacob and rather than confessing, he just weeps again, but doesn't confess. So I wanted to show you that in the scripture. So the first camp I said were his servants and they gave him 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, two, you see two, two, two all the way through here, number 30, number 40, number 10. These are all huge biblical numbers. And it's not incidental that these are used. Two is the number of unity and that's what he's seeking. 30 is the number of um, revelation. 40 is universal, and it means north, south, east, west, or 40 can also be the number of judgment or new beginnings. So you see um, 40 here, and then, of course, 10 bulls, bulls being the most powerful, and that's symbolic of the Ten Commandments or completion. So all of these numbers have to do with reconciliation, completion, and uh, new beginnings. And so, in unity. And then, then he sends Leah and he sends Rachel and Joseph last. So these two camps could also represent two brides, right? Leah and Rachel. Now remember, Leah came first. She could represent Israel because the first time the Messiah came, he came for Israel. And then Rachel, the one second, was the church or the Gentile nations that would come from these two women. So it's interesting that you could also look at it that way. So Jacob wants to reconcile, right? Esau, representing the world, back to the church. So 
this is the whole point of studying Torah, is that we can understand our Jewish brothers and sisters. They can see that we understand them and relate to them and hopefully bring them back together in the spirit of unity so they can worship God as one, echad. That means a composite unity where all barriers are broken down. That's the goal of why I teach Torah. So remember, Asa was a man of the field, and we said he was a world, worldly man. And anytime you see the word field, that's Jesus said the field is the world or the world system or cosmos. Now, Jacob was promised the same blessings as his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham, many descendants. And perhaps he reasoned that if God's plan was to only reserve this remnant, then God's people would still be able to thrive and return to the land of Israel. And that's what he's hoping to see happen. Now it says he sent them all ahead, but that night it says Jacob wrestled with a man. Some say it was an angel. Some say it was the Messiah. Some say it was just a man. But it says he wrestled until dawn the break of dawn. And it said the man touched his hip socket, which would forever change how Jacob walked. The man said, let me go. But Jacob refused until he received the promise, the blessing of God. Now, to me, this is so important. These spiritual principles here, because don't forget, Jacob persevered and prevailed against his enemies and God multiplied favor and promise and blessing. So here he's wrestling again and he's prevailing. Remember I said his name means a reward. So he's wrestling for the reward. He's wrestling with this man. He wants the blessing spiritually and he is going to prevail and his name is going to be changed at this point from Yaakov, meaning to prevail or to follow after. This is his heart, is to follow after God and receive the reward, the blessing. And so he changes his name to Yisrael or Israel. So we identify with the God of Jacob or the faith of Abraham, his grandfather. So we recognize that if we prevail, if we want to follow after the, the patriarchs and the faith of our patriarchs, we too must learn to wrestle with God over decisions, to go to him in prayer, to persevere, even if it takes five years, 10 years, 20 years. Look how long Jacob wrestled and fought with Laban to get the blessing that God promised him. So God's people will begin always with a change of name and a new way to walk. And it's in this story of the faithful one, Jacob. So it's also our story. So we are willing to leave it all behind, go into exile, be misunderstood, and sometimes persecuted for our faith in order to receive ultimately the victory from God. Now, he wrestled with this angel, said angel of the Lord, until the break of dawn. Let me show you what this word dawn means. What's interesting is, notice he wrestled in the darkness. Now, many times spiritually, this is what we do when we're in a very dark place, is we'll wrestle with God. And, and I've been there. I know you, you have too, where something happens tragic or something unexpected happens that uh, causes great heartache and you go to God and you wrestle with him. Why? Why? Why is this happening? I've been following you faithfully and yet you allowed this. Why, God? I know I've done that. To, to wrestle with him until the break of dawn. I want to show you this word. Dawn is shakar. Shakar means to diligently seek revelation and it means light. So he's going to wrestle until what? God shows him why. You see? It's in this word, I'm going to wrestle until dawn. He goes, look, dawn's coming. 
give me the blessing. I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to stay here until you give it to me. And then he gets revelation. And he touches his hip socket. And to this day, Jews do not eat that sciatic nerve on the flank of a lamb or on the shank because of this story. And he was willing to do that and wrestle until he had revelation, shakar. Now, Jacob said, I met face, God, face to face, and my life was spared. Now, this hit me so uh, huge this time through. He called the place Peniel, meaning Pani is, is the face or my face, and my face saw God. Now, what's interesting is Pan also comes from the word Pana, which means to turn, change direction, to focus your attention, and accept something new. So look at He's saying, I saw God's face because when we have an encounter with the living God and we become born again spiritually, we see God's face. Not literally, but spiritually, we see God's face because we're willing to turn, go a different direction, and accept God's Holy Spirit into our life and begin a new walk with him. See all these rich Hebrew words? Put these in your book. Peniel, the face of God, means to change direction. When we see his face and we have spiritual revelation through his Holy Spirit, that's exactly what happens when we're born again. And look what happens. We turn back to him and we spiritually become born again. Look what Isaiah 59 says, which is just the opposite. When we're sinners, we don't see his face. And it says so right here. Your sins have separated you from your God. He has hidden his face and will not hear us. So there's only one prayer that God will hear when we aren't his children. And that is, God, show me that you're real. Have mercy on me and reveal yourself to me. That's the prayer God hears. And then, at the proper time, when he removes all the stoniness of our hearts at the right time, when the soil is soft, God drops that seed in, the seed of faith, and we, the, it takes root, and we begin our new walk with him, just like Jacob began a new walk in his name, and life was changed. And that's exactly what we see here. Now, he says, I saw him face to face and my life was spared. Here's the word spared here. This is a beautiful word. It's the word natsal right here. It means I was delivered or rescued or set free. And that's exactly what happens when we meet Yeshua face to face and spiritually we're rescued and set free. Rescued from what? People say, well, what is God saving me from? I say he's saving you from the penalty of sin, which is death. And he ultimately saves us from an eternal destiny, which is the lake of fire. And so he sets us free from all of that debt because he paid the debt. And look, the word shadow is in there because we're made in his image. It's the same two letters, see? Sadi Lamed, Sadi Lamed means shadow. So when we're rescued or spared, we now begin to walk in his shadow. We walk with him in his image. And look, the word for a lifeguard is Matzil, Matzil. And that's because a lifeguard reaches into the darkness and brings you into new life, right? And look, the ambulance service in Israel is called Hatzla. And here you see that Saudi Lamed even in the ambulance drivers in Israel. Because why? They rescue us from the shadow of death. There are spiritual lifeguards, just like Jesus is our spiritual lifeguard. Remember the 23rd Psalm? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for he's with me. Thy rod and staff deliver me from death. It's right there. 
And then here, I wanted to show you the ambulance right here. See, Sadi Lamed, and on the back of his clothes here, Sadi Lamed. Look at Isaiah 9 2, another place where I saw a shadow. The people who are walking in darkness have seen a great light. People of Israel, they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So see, the Israelites were to be that light and referred to as a shadow. And here's Sadi Lamed here in that scripture from Isaiah 9 too. So don't you just love this? Put all those words in your book. Now, Jacob's name was changed to Yisrael, and here's some more fun words. This is jam-packed with Hebrew, and, and I hope that you can appreciate this and put it in your book or write it down and then put it in the back of your Bible. When you see the word Israel, it has another word in it, two words actually. Yashar means to go straight or to be right or righteous. And it's the word yashar. See it here in Israel? Yashar. Yod, sin, resh. And it's here, yasar. And it means to go straight. And then also it has the word sar for a prince or a ruler. And they call one of the names of the Messiah sar shalom, right? Now, when Yaakov, Jacob, began his new way of walking, the limp reminded him that he would overcome trials and be victorious if he continued to pursue and follow after the God of his fathers. See, the word pursue is Akov. That's his name. And to follow after, Akov, right here. That's in the name of Jacob, right here. Ayan. Kof, bet, ayin kof, bet means to follow after or pursue. So it says that he would walk with a limp, and it's this word, pasak. Pesak comes from there, same word for Passover. Why? Because when they came out of Egypt, the angel of death passed over or stepped over as if limping those with the blood on the doorposts. It's the same word. So it's it ties it right away to the Israelites being in exile and coming out and the angel limping over, skipping houses when they had the blood on them. So what a wonderful word Pesach is here when Jacob began to limp. So I wanted to show you where the word sar comes in. The Prince of Peace is in Isaiah 9, 6, right? A child is born, a son. They're talking about the Messiah. He would be a prince. And here it is, sar and sar in this story. And then I want to show you one more thing. It says the government would be upon his shoulders. In the government, you see the word sar again because it's misra. It's just a different form, and it means the one who will govern. So it says the government will be on his shoulder. Who's the prince of peace? Sar Shalom. So I wanted to show you how those were related. And here's the word Musar. It's a sound alike. So here's um, Misra, and Misra comes from this word Musar because a Musar means to correct, or it means to disciple someone. So the government is to correct and disciple. See, it's all the same word, but they're related, spelled differently, but the meanings are the same. So I hope I haven't lost you there. Um, and then I wanted to show you also the word, um, one of the names, he's a mighty counselor, right? Here's the word ets, and it's also the third um, the third feast where Jesus rose from the dead, it, it parallels back, if you go back to Bereshit, the, um, the uh, seven spirits was in the third place, and that spirit is the spirit of counsel. And it's right here in this that his name would be a counselor. And they're referring to the Prince of Peace. And who is that counselor? He rose from the dead on that same 
third spirit. Um, you'll have to go back to look at that and uh, you'll see here that it shows up. And defining, the reason I'm showing you all this is because all these words keep like echoing, echoing, echoing the one that would come and fulfill over 300 prophecies in the Torah, in the Tanakh. So all these hints, print, he'd be a prince, the government would be on his shoulder, he'd be a wonderful counselor. Um, all these are phonetic clues. He would correct what was wrong and he would make disciples. So that's the reason I'm going into detail here. And then I want to show you a website. It's called HebrewForChristians.com. You can go there and see the blessing of the Musar. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the word Sar Shalom related to that, the prince. Okay, here it is here. But the blessing that they actually say is the um, when someone chastens or corrects things, they're called a Musar. And so here you see a Musar denotes a fatherly correction. Hear my child, the Musar of your father. And don't forsake the Torah or the instructions of your mother. And so look at all these connections here when you start um, learning Hebrew. So I want to inspire you to learn Hebrew. That's why I'm showing you all this. So um, thank you for bearing with me. Okay, so then I want to show you also because a Musar is a teacher and has to do with correction and training and making disciples. Well, look here in the New Testament, you call me teacher. And Lord, and that's what Jesus said. If I'm your teacher and Lord, then I have to wash your feet. And then I showed a couple other things where it says the Torah or instructions was our teacher to bring us to the Messiah. And now that we, the teacher has come, faith has come through him, then it says we're no longer under the teacher, which is the instructions of the law, but now we're under the guidance of the Messiah through the Holy Spirit. So all of these things are connected. Now, Jacob says, wrestled with the ish, ha-ish, the man. And I thought, oh my gosh, someday all of us have to come face to face with the man and wrestle with him. Remember when Jesus came to his disciples and he said to Peter, who do you say that I am? And this is the only question, people, that you're going to be asked when you stand before the throne of God. In the final judgment, you're going to be asked, who did you say Jesus was? Was he your Lord and master or was he just a figure, a dusty, antiquated prophet from the, you know, the Old Testament? Who do you say I am is what you're going to be asked. And so we're all going to have to wrestle at some point in our life with who was Jesus. You see, he's not like anyone else in any other religion. He's the only one who came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We don't earn our way to heaven like all the other religions. He did what we couldn't do, which is pay the sin debt. And then he offers it to us through his shed blood. And it's a picture of that blood back at the Passover again on the doorpost. They're all connected. So Jacob's name was changed to the fact that he pursued and prevailed for the reward. And we too will receive the reward. It's tied to the faith of Israel. So we will get a new faith when we walk in that same kind of faith. And we'll have a new way of walking. And now, did you know? That Israel, that name Israel and Jacob and his father and grandfather, the three patriarchs, are all related to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is Israel, and we're grafted in to that tree of faith. Remember in Acts 1, 6, it says, then they all gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore what? The kingdom back to who? Israel. That's what we see in this story. Jacob was faithful, and God is called the God of Jacob. And we see in Acts them referring back to the God of Israel or Jacob.
and that's tied to the kingdom. So I wanted to point that out in Acts. Now, Jacob or Israel personally came to Esau with gifts and they called those gifts Mincha. And I wanted to also show you some fun words that you can look at that have to do with this story. More Hebrew, the noon and the chet in this offering. Now we are to be an offering because he says we're to be living sacrifices in the New Testament. Well, look at all the places you find these two letters, noon, het. They're all going to be related somehow in meaning. It comes in this word gift. Jacob was to be a gift to his brother. We're to be a gift to the world. And look at what other words. Necha means lead to a goal. What was the goal of Jacob? Peace with his brother. So that's the word Nacha. Noach means comfort because he was bringing comfort to his brother. He, he brought gifts for peace to comfort his brother. And then look, compassion is Nacham, and it means to change someone's attitude. So look, in this beautiful gift or offering are all these related nuances in this. You should put every one of these in your Bible because they're so meaningful. This means protection. And look, it looks like a doorpost in the Passover story. And this noon is the uh, ancient symbol of a sperm or new life. So this is all so beautiful in this story. I have a few more slides and then a few more dramatic things happen. So hang in there. Jacob arrived back then. After uh, Esau left, he came back into Canaan near the town of Shechem. He arrived there in peace, and it was an answer to his prayer. Remember when God said he, he, he was going to send them back and he would have descendants and multiply him? He said, I will bring me back to my father's land in peace. And that's exactly what we see happening here. So remember I said, sometimes when we prevail, we might not see the answer for 10 years, 20 years. So here's Jacob now returning to the land of Canaan in peace. So he bought a piece of land there in Shechem for a hundred pieces of silver. So again, we see that number 10 or 100 or 1,000. And silver is always relating to something being complete or its redemption. So Jacob is being redeemed. He's being brought to the land of promise. And we see 100 pieces of silver show up in this story. What happens also is he builds an altar. So the first thing that happens is he purchases a land, okay? He decides to go back. And then he purchases land and he begins to worship. And then he calls the place El Elohe Yisrael, which means God, God of Israel, or my God. See, Jacob, you could interchange the names here. So Jacob has had many God encounters. Why? To build trust, to strengthen him. But trust is also tested. Haven't you learned that in your own faith walk? That God will, you'll worship him, there'll be blessings, and then he brings you into a new trial. And then there's more that we have to trust him with. And that's how we get strong. I always say as a personal trainer, you have to push against weights, push against resistance in order to be strengthened. And so we see that um, we have to be tested. So after the reconciliation, Esau returns, but Jacob goes and he builds booths. And he builds booths for his family and all his cattle. And a booth is called a sukkah. And this is where the feast of Sukkot is celebrated because of Jacob returning, finalizing the 12 tribes of Israel. So to this day, on the um, festival of booths, which is um, the last feast in the uh, seven feasts. There it is again. The last one, seventh one, is the Feast of Sukkot or the building of the booths or tabernacle. Uh, Sometimes that's called. So in the future, did you know that all nations are going to go up to where? Jerusalem, 
to hear the Torah read and to worship Adonai at this feast. It will be the only feast celebrated in God's kingdom when he comes and sets up his kingdom for that thousand years. It said all nations will go up to where? Israel. And to what city? Jerusalem or Jerusalem. And now Jerusalem is officially the capital of Israel. So I always say to everybody, keep your eyes on Israel. The church has to support Israel and the land because it all has to do with the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Israel and Ishmael. They are not the spiritual seed. They are the enemies of Israel. And we'll see that again in the very last battle uh, at the end of days. Now, blessings also are followed, like I said, with challenges. So when they get to Shechem and he sets up all these booths, he sends his daughter into the city to meet the girls of Shechem. And this is when she is raped by the son of Hamor, who was the leader of that area in Shechem at the time. His son, Shechem, is uh, rapes Dinah, and um, he takes her captive. We don't see that here, but later we'll see that he wants his sister back. So obviously, not only was she raped, but she was kept with uh, Shechem. So Hamor, his father, his name means an ass or a beast of burden or trouble. Ham, remember, was one of the sons of Jacob. Hamor is in that name. Ham means passion or to be heated or angry. It's also the word for stubbornness, a beast of burden, an ass. Okay, so Simeon and Levi come in just as Jacob hears about this rape and they want to bring justice and they plot to take revenge into their own hands. And this doesn't turn out well for anyone in the end. Um, God didn't tell them to go do this. They took things into their own hands. And remember, it says it's mine to avenge in Deuteronomy 32. And so um, this was found in the Song of Moses says, let God take revenge. And sometimes we want to just go and say what we want to say or do what we want to say because we're so angry. I always say when someone gets angry, or I said this to my boys and to my husband, please don't go do anything until you've waited a day or two, you've prayed about it, you've gotten wise counsel before you do anything. Just going in your anger always always backfires. And then we see it in this story. Here's what happens. So Shechem, the crown prince of the city, wants to marry her, right? And so what happens is he sends his father back to Jacob and his brothers, the two brothers, and says, um, let us take her for a bride. Let my son Shechem have her. And Simeon and Levi say, well, you know, it's it, if we're going to make a deal and we want our sister back, um, what we need to do first, if, if we're going to let you have her, is all your males have to be circumcised. And so Hamar Hamor goes to all the men of the city and says, okay, so the rich and the powerful have connections and they're making these deals back, you know, backroom deals still going on today. The rich and the powerful want control. And they say, okay, so here's the deal. I'll give you this if you give me that. And so this deal is made. Never a good idea when it's not God's idea. So these men agree to be circumcised. So what happens? And I say, oh my gosh, they agreed to go through these religious ceremonies just so they can get their way because they're rich and powerful. And we see this today too. And, and we see it, people like, oh, and then they are coming from church. And then it shows, you know, Obama, or it shows um, um, the Clintons, or it shows, you know, uh, the Bushes coming from church. Well, God will decide who the authentic ones were and one, ones who were just being religious. Remember, there's two C groups. So God will decide in the end. But the point is, people will do religious activity in order to get their way. But spiritually, 
this is never a good idea. So it says on the third day, remember I said, if you see third day, pay attention, sit up. While the men were in pain, the two brothers come and they take the city. They kill all the men. And what happens? Jacob says, now my name's a stench here. And so he couldn't stay there anymore. He has to leave. So God told Jacob to leave Shechem and return back to Bethel. So Jacob built an altar, once again prays, and God reaffirms his promise. And he says, don't worry, I'm going to even be with you when you go to Bethel. And he says, I'm going to be El Shaddai to you. And that means, Shaddai means uh, to multiply or the God, the God of enough. And it's the word for breast. When you're, when you're breastfeeding faithfully a baby, then the baby will be enough when it's fed from the breast of the mother. So it's a picture of the faithful one, God, El Shaddai. And he says, you will be fruitful and multiply for a nation and a community will come from you, Jacob. So the nation of Israel will come from Jacob. And this is the promise that he makes to Jacob on the way to Bethel. So Rachel on the way there gave birth to her second son, Ben. And in her birth, it says that she died having Ben. And she called him Ben-Oni, or the born of my suffering. But Jacob called him Ben-Yamim, or Benjamin, son of my right hand. Now, it's very interesting. Um, I just met a man at the gym not too long ago, and we got into a conversation. He told me his name was Benjamin. And just this morning, while I was listening to this study with another rabbi, I was at the gym laying on the floor stretching, and Benjamin walks by. And he goes, oh, you look like you've been laying there too long. Now let's get going. And I, I said, oh, I was just listening to a story about you. He says, you were? And I said, yeah. I said, do you know what your name means? Remember I told you, Benjamin, when I first met you, your name means son of my right hand, Ben Yamim. He goes, yeah, I remember that. I said, well, I, it also means the son of the south. And he goes, really? Why? I said, well, because when the Jewish people pray, they face east. So the son of favor would be the son of my right hand or to the south. And he goes, that is really funny that you said that. He says, I was born and raised between Florida and Georgia in the south. And I go, well, there you go. He goes, oh, I, you, I, you always tell me such fun things. I said, well, I got a lot more in there. <laughs> and he, he laughed. I said, my husband says I have no, no um, stop button. So anyway, more to come from Benjamin or son of the South. So Rachel died on the way there to somewhere on the way to Bethlehem. Uh, they were on their way from Ephrata and Ephrata is on the way to Bethlehem. And we always think of the son who was born near there uh, to Rachel. And it points to Benjamin or near Bethlehem. So between Jerusalem and Bethlehem is where the son, the favorite son, the one that completes the 12 tribes, dies between there. And that's exactly in the story of the Passover when they went to Bethlehem, got the lamb, and went back to Jerusalem on Passover to sacrifice the lamb was the exact time that Jesus, the Passover lamb, was crucified. Did you know that? So this story all points to a future uh, story in the New Testament. So some people say that perhaps this death, uh, that the death of Rachel is because, remember, when um, Jacob said, whoever stole those idols will die. Well, there, it echoes perhaps that curse here in her death. But the son completed the house of Israel. And as I said, was born between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. So the parasha now ends with Jacob returning back to Hebron. And his father, Isaac, who's 180 years old, dies. And Esau comes up and the two of them bury their father together. And what's interesting, it says he lived 180 years. Remember when I said the word uh, of the number 18 is the number of life? 
because the two letters het and yod add up to eight and ten. And so anytime you see 18 or multiples of 18 or 180, it was a full life. It said he died with his full of days, meaning it's an idiom. Full of days means I completed my destiny, my God shaped destiny. And you see the number 18 in his death. And so they bury Esau. Now, chapter 36 is all about Esau's genealogy. And next week, I'm going to point out just a couple things in that chapter. We can't do it today, but just to know that from Esau came the enemies of Jacob and Israel. So in the spiritual, there were still going to be enemies, even though you see in the physical here, some what seems to be some reconciliation, and they both get together in unity to bury their father spiritually, there's still going to be enmity between them, just like it said in Genesis 3.15. Remember that? So the Amal uh, Amalekites would be the enemies of Israel when they come out of Egypt with Moses, and then in the story of Esther, Haman was from the Amalekites, also from Esau's line. So lots of enemies in the future of Israel through Esau and the Edomites. And we'll even see that it's um, talked about Edomites being destroyed and Esau being destroyed and that their names not remembered in Obadiah 1, 1 through 21 and Jeremiah 49, 7 through 21. It speaks of that also. And then I pulled this up from online. It says, Edom was removed from its land in the 5th century BC, and there were no survivors of Edom today. This fulfilled Obadiah 118, which says, they shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor from the house of Esau. So that's what the prophet said, and that's exactly what happened. Some first century leaders, such as Herod the Great, also traced their ancestry back to Edom, another enemy of Israel. And all mention, Edom, all mention of Edomites fades from all history. By the end of the fourth century, even Jerome referenced the land of Edom, Edomia, but the people of the region had long since disappeared as a people group. So interesting that we see uh, this played out from Esau. So like our three patriots, we two people will struggle and wrestle with the man, okay? And sometimes we give up too soon and we settle for something that seems good, but it's not ultimately God's best. Some say good is the thief, of God's best. Well, in this uh, story, thankfully, Jacob persevered and made it back to the promised land. And next week, we'll begin the story of Joseph. But know that even within our mistakes, that there's always hope. We can come back to God when we've made mistakes, and we too can build an altar. How do we do that? In our heart, this little place, our will and our water, that's our personal altar. And we can go there and with a heart of humility, repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I took things into my own hands and look at the mess I made. Father, forgive me and show me as long as it's possible for me to be at peace. Show me how to reconcile this situation as long as it depends on me. Sometimes we can't do it because the other party won't listen or will refuse to be reconciled. But we always have to do our best to be children of faith and walk out like our father, Jacob, in the faith of Israel and Abraham. So we too can go back to what we were meant to be in the beginning. And so I think that that is a perfect place to end. And let me show you this last saying. Never be afraid to trust your unknown future to a known God. So when we know him and we can trust him, just like um, Abraham trusted him and Isaac and Jacob, we too 
will see victory when we prevail and pursue the God of Israel. So if you're in a troubled situation today, won't you take some time to pray and ask God, build an altar in your heart and say, God, I blew it. I took things into my own hands. I was angry. Father, show me how to bring a gift to reconcile. Sometimes it's just going back and being the first one to say, I'm sorry, I wounded you. But don't have excuses in your hand or the other person won't feel it as repentance. Not easy to do, but always brings forth fruit eventually. So God bless you. Be sure and share this with your friends and family. And don't forget, if you want these PowerPoints, you have to email me at rjlevis at gmail.com. Shabbat Shalom. I'll see you next time on Sparky Storytime.